Hello and welcome to another installment of Developer Spotlight. Today we're looking at the history in games, the highs and the lows of Sensible Software, who were responsible for some of the Amiga's most iconic games and ruled Europe in the 16-bit era. And we're joined by one of Sensible Software's founders, John Hare, and Sensible Software artist, Stu Cambridge. Sensible Software was established in 1986 by John and school friend Chris Yates. They had performed together in various bands over the years. I started making games uh, because a friend of mine, uh, Chris Yates, I was at school with Chris, and uh, we started playing in a band together in the, in the fifth year at school. We went, we met each other going to a gig and came back, we found out we liked the same kind of music, and uh, we formed a band and we started to write songs together. And then we get to 1985, we're playing this music, and we both gone to college, and we both kind of dropped out of college because we wanted to do our band thing. Uh, and it was the old Thatcher years, you know. So in those times, there weren't a lot of jobs. Like you left school, it's like, what job can I do? Well, there aren't any. So it meant that the government needed to support pioneer businesses a little bit more. Jobs come from business. Business comes from pleasing the customer. And this is why we've put so much emphasis on more small business. I was around Chris's house, we were making music, and he said, right, I'm going to try and get myself a job as a computer programmer. I teach myself a program. So he was using these old K's and Littlewoods catalogues to get a, a spectrum at the time. That was ZX81 at the time. And you could get them for a month and you could send them back. And he did it three times in a row and taught himself how to program and got a job. So he managed it. On the third one, he, he got a good demo together of Snoopy flying around on the kennel. Uh, got himself a job with a local company called LT Software. And um, uh, they got him to make a game called Sod Off the Sorcerer, which was a, which basically was a conversion uh, onto the ZX81 from a different machine. Prior to forming Sensible Software, they worked for LT Software for nine months, creating Twister for the ZX Spectrum. John would handle the art, while Chris did the programming, a dynamic that proved to work very well. I was at Chris's house one day and he was doing this new work he'd done and uh, he couldn't do the art for it very well and I like did art at college or theatre design stuff so I said I'll have a go at doing the art then why not I'll try it so I just for a bit of fun messed around and drew some wizards and some dragons and stuff although the dragons look a bit like T-Rexes when I look back at the art but anyway the, the company liked my work so then the company offered me a job so now me and Chris were both working for the same company as young consultants we were both 19 at the time yeah after we'd done that game then they commissioned us to do a game on our own a game called twister which was the first game we actually did so twister was done on the spectrum which was the first game we'd done in color and it was the first game we did together with a two-man band it was pretty good for a spectrum game it wasn't great it was okay it was for us it's not a bad start and uh, of course we were working for lt software at the time and it was coming out for system three so we weren't officially sensible software didn't exist but we decided we want to set our own company up called Sensible Software. So we put a little cheat key in that you could tap something in that it says buy Sensible Software. When we finished that, we were like, okay, we can make a game and it got reviewed and it was okay. And we're like, great, okay, we know, we know what we're doing now. We then became aware of this government enterprise scheme, a government scheme at the time, specifically because of young people like us who couldn't find work. And what they'd said is, we will allow you to set your own company up and we'll pay you 40 pounds a week per person to set your own company out. We were like, well, when we were young, 40 pounds a week wasn't a lot, but we were both living with our parents at the time. So it was affordable. Chris lived with his dad and his dad was away a lot, uh, but it meant we had a place to work from, like the spare bedroom in his house was a legitimate place to go to work. So we were like, okay, we can do this. The only snag was you needed a thousand pounds in the bank each as well. And we were both totally skinned basically. And you needed to have been on the dole for 13 weeks, which is, kind of a, an insane combo, right? So the only solution was to sign on to the dole for exactly 13 weeks. Part two, to continue to work in able to have the thousand pounds we needed to start the company up. So we basically went through this period where we signed on for exactly 13 weeks. We also managed to get a contract for another game for exactly 2000 pounds, which was enough for the two of us to qualify because we needed 2000, we needed a thousand each. And we made this game, and actually the game never came out in the end. It was it was been by the by the publisher, but we got paid this game called um, Runestone, and um, it was again it was a conversion to the Commodore 64 from another machine. 
But he got us going on the Commodore 64. It's kind of like a free hit of learning the Commodore 64 as well. So in March of 1986, exactly 13 weeks after we signed on, we signed off again. Um, and we just got the money in from from this game that we didn't that didn't come out, but we kind of finished our work. And uh, then we started Sensible Software up in, in March of 1986 uh, with our £2,000 in the bank. And uh, and that first year, I mean, knowing that you've got a little bit of money coming in each week is, is enough to get you started. And I think it also taught us an important lesson that I see a lot of companies failing on now, is that people want to take money out of their company before it's really ready to pay. And we, we all automatically restricted ourselves to only £40 a week, which wasn't a lot but enough to survive. I think we bought a Spectrum, sorry, a Commodore 64 for me. And maybe Chris already had one, or maybe we needed to buy that, I can't remember. Either way, that was it. That was our outlay. On that, we did Parallax. Released in October of 1986, Parallax was Sensible Software's first game, published by Ocean on the Commodore 64. Parallax was a top-down shooter, named Parallax due to its use of parallax scrolling, creating a great sense of depth to the playfield. The player pilots a ship, but can also exit the ship and enter rooms on foot. It was a good first effort for Sensible Software and got their foot in the door with Ocean. This association with Ocean also started a relationship with composer Martin Galway, who did the soundtrack, a musician well known for his Commodore 64 music. And so we did Parallax from the March, and then in about the May or the June, we went down to, up to Ocean in Manchester. Uh, we managed to get them to look at the game, which was great. And they said they loved the game, and they signed it up on the first day. They gave us a contract for £5,000, a cheque for, for £1,000. On our first day of business, as like kids, you know. So we went back celebrating, we were singing We're In The Money, and we, we, we were like, yeah, we, we've done it. I mean, it was an awful contract, I and mean, we got totally fleeced, really. But it was a break, and, you know, Ocean were a good publisher to work for, and and we made Parallax, and Parallax built our reputation as an interesting new developer, you know. Galaxy Birds came the same year, published on the C64 by Firebird Software. The title might make you think that this was a Galaxian clone, but really it's just a spaceship shooting waves of oncoming geese. It doesn't have the enemies lined up before cascading down toward the player's ship, they just come at you from the top of the screen, and very quickly. In 1987 they signed another game with Ocean, Whizball, an intriguing scrolling shooter partly inspired by Gradius, released for the Commodore 64, ZX Spectrum and Amstrad CPC. Martin Galway was back doing the soundtrack. Well, I say it's a shoot 'em up, but that doesn't really explain it at all. The story is bizarre, to say the least. You're a wizard who's turned himself into a ball in order to restore colour to the game world, which has been drained of it. Yes, that grayscale landscape is a gameplay choice rather than a mere limitation of the hardware. You start off as a simple bouncing ball, but can collect several power-ups which allow you to fly and shoot, which is when it becomes more like a traditional scrolling shooter. One upgrade is this option, which is actually the wizard's cat, which has been turned into a quote, catalyte. This catalyte is what actually collects the colour, so equipping this is essential to completing the levels. After that we signed the next game, which was Whizball. Had we known that the royalties were unlikely to be forthcoming from the first game, we might not have signed with Ocean again, but we didn't know at the time, so we signed with Whizball. We got slightly more money up front, and Whizball started because Chris was a big Defender fan, and we played a lot of Archer McLean's Drop Zone, which was the kind of inspiration for this kind of game. And then we once we'd got, we, we kind of had this ball moving around to get the Whizball. It literally was a circle that kind of went spinning around and bounced, and then bounced again. And then I drew the the whizball face thing on it so it had a bit more character and then it, it grew from there then we then we then we grew the game out so you you gained weapons like nemesis and salamander and those were big games at the time so like you know you managed to stabilize the movement then you got the firing the bullets and then the catalyte and then collecting the droplets and everything else it all just came out it's like a lot of most of our games happen from an idea you do it you execute it well you're happy with that part, then you bolt on the next idea, then the next idea, and continue to grow it out. And that's how the earlier games we made worked, like that. So they kind of organically evolved. I think towards the end of what we were doing, we realised that we needed a little bit more sophistication in the process of making them. 
Their next game, also released in 1987, was the result of trying to create a tool they could use to create their own games, Shoot 'em Up Construction Kit, published by Palace Software on the Commodore 64 and Amiga. Shoot 'em Up Construction Kit came about by a very curious way. So we'd realised that we were, we were making these games and they were taking us about eight or nine months and we were getting okay money for them. In those early days, we were making enough to survive, to live off of. You know, it was good. It wasn't great, you know. But it was it was good, and games like Wizball and Parallax. I mean, Wizball got great critical acclaim, but it didn't really make that much money, you know. So when we did Shoot Up Construction Kit, the idea was that Chris would make a utility for me, and then I could do the art, and we could knock out a whole bunch of games fast, and we could make more money. That was the plan, right? That was the the basic plan. Like we can make our own internal factory of game making, if you like. However, after five months, maybe we realised that the quality of games we could get out of our machine wasn't as good as something like Wizball or even Parallax and never would be. Like, it's just there was a limitation on what you could do by this, the, the manner we'd done the construction kit. However, the construction kit is a tool to use because I was using it every day. It was fantastic. So I suggested to Chris, we should just sell the tool and forget about this idea about making games people will buy. I mean... I ended up making four demo games uh, in there. And, and, and my job became make the demo material to, as the examples of what you can do. But basically we decided to just hone and refine the tool that Chris had given me until he got up to a level where it was really, you know, could be used by, 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 by players. Uh, which turned out to be a smart idea. I mean, that was actually our first number one game. Shoot em up construction kit with, um, with Palace. So yeah, that was, it was nice to like, to go into something with a bit of variety to it, and I guess that was the first bit of real variety. Shoot 'em Up Construction Kit was the first sensible game to feature Richard Joseph as composer. He would go on to provide the music for many of their games going forward, composing some of the 16-bit home computer era's finest work for Sensible Software and the Bitmap Brothers. 1988 also saw the release of Oh No on the Commodore 64, published by Silverbird. Another top-down shooter, this was somewhat ironically a rip-off of an arcade game called Rip-Off. In 1989 came Insects in Space, a Defender clone published by Hewson, which came to the Commodore 64, Amiga and Atari ST. Most of these games are inspired by or directly copied from existing arcade games. Yeah, everything was inspired by arcade machines. Everything. I think, I think most of us developers in, in the UK we were really yeah, riffing off of um, arcade machines. Uh, we did um, Oh No, which was a direct rip-off of a game called Rip-Off. Galaxy Birds was, was a Galaxians thing. Insects in Space was again another Defender kind of type game. So yeah, like nearly all of them. In fact, all of them. <laughs> and right up, right up to, right to Micropro Soccer, it was just taking the inspiration from the, the arcade games, yeah. Microprose Soccer was published in 1988 by Microprose, obviously, for the Commodore 64, with ports coming to the ZX Spectrum, Amiga, Amstrad CPC, Atari ST and DOS. Me and Chris both like football. I really love to take on World Cup, the arcade machine. Pretty early tabletop machine, so you had a track ball either side and two buttons to mm. move them around. Then you had like a button for pass and a button for shoot, I think. Um, but the viewpoint of it, we stole and put in Micropro Soccer. So that kind of scale of pitch, sprites came from Take On World Cup. In North America, it was renamed Keith Van Eren's Pro Soccer. We wanted to call that game Sensible Soccer. In fact, we did call it Sensible Soccer. And we went and pitched it around to different companies. And Micropros, who are an American publisher, uh, surprisingly offered us, said they were interested in the game. They offered us 30,000 pounds, which was the most we'd ever been offered for a game by then. But the catch was they wanted to call it Micropro Soccer instead of Sensible Soccer. So we were like, okay, 30 grand was good. And we, we were like, okay. And they said, and we'd like you to do American Indoor Soccer because they play six-a-side soccer indoors in America. And then, yeah, and that we added that. So we added that piece. It was international teams. It was a lot of fun, that game, because we added rain. But people had done that. We added this, like, a rewind thing where you can where you can like rewind the goals and do a videotape effect and it went black and white and there was a lot of touches we had these overlaid sprites so we had a colored sprite and then a 
black and white thin sprite over the top to give a kind of like an outlined diff different definition. So there's a bunch of technical innovation in Micro Soccer as well as a good football game for the time. A bit slow now if you play it, but good. Uh, and we put ball bending in it. And we put the ball bending in it because in, my, in Take On World Cup, the ball, you could see it was bending slightly as it went towards the goal. Now we didn't realise, I read about this a couple of years ago, but that was actually a bug. The guy had not written his straight line code properly, so sometimes it bent. But we turned it into a proper, real mega banana kick kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, it was a, it was at the time CMBG called it the best sports game on any machine ever. So at the time, it did it did its thing, and um, I guess it was a precursor to sensible soccer. In as much as we'd done a football game before, we knew how to make one. We knew we were good enough at it. For MicroPro Soccer, Martin Galway had joined Sensible Software, making a three-man team. So yeah, Martin joined us. And the intention with Martin was, when you've got a games musician, it doesn't take a lot of time to do the music compared to the rest of the game. So a musician will tend to come in at the end of the game for a month, maybe if, maybe even a few weeks in some cases. And obviously you've got sound effects as well, but all in all, it's not that much work. So we didn't have enough work for Martin him to be a full-time just a musician and at the same time we realized that as an artist i could make more games worth of art in a month in, you know i could make a game worth of art say every three months whereas the programming took six months so you realize that i could make the art for two games at once and uh design wise chris and i pretty much shared the design in most of the stuff but uh we decided there was a game you know next game we did chris could work on one game with me and we kind of share the design i do the art but then there's another game i could do with martin as a lead programmer and um i would do the art work with martin and i would be more involved in the design of controlling that one with martin um so that was the plan and we made a game called let me get the name right touchstone and uh we we started making the game which was a pretty ambitious uh kind of we, we were talking a bit with the guys from Ultima, the guys who make Ultima at the time, Origin Systems, and we were looking at doing a game that was um, a kind of uh, adventure in the same sense, but it was very ambitious. The concept of Touchstone was that you were in a kind of medieval world, so you walk around the world, but also you did magic with runes, and um, you had the plot was that your wife was very ill and you had to heal her and you had to heal her body so you had to go inside her body like like in inner space and her mind and her soul i think the soul was like um a place where we had these i invented these astrology systems you had these 13 astrology signs and you had to like assemble these rune things in certain places you know to get the magic something to happen that was the soul bit and then the the mind bit was like a series of memories she had you had to mend so you had to mend a mind a body and a soul and part of the plot involved bringing her bringing your own dead father back to life or was it her dead father back to life to heal her so basically the, the plot was that everyone wore a rune around their neck which was the first letter of their name and to do the spells you needed to put the runes together to spell the the word you know the incantation and of course some guys had very rare letters around their neck like he was the only person with his name who began with that letter so you had to bring them back to life. So you had to do a Lazarus spell to bring them back to life to get the final letter around their neck to do the spell that would actually finally heal her. So it was a, it, the problem with the game was, was it was pretty ambitious, actually. And unfortunately, it, you got a coinciding thing where I, as a designer, was going, right, let's go for it. It's the first time I'd really gone, let's go for it. We're not doing an arcade thing here. We're doing a, like a whoa, big world, you know. And I hadn't, I hadn't had the experience at that time of working with, with a team to understand how you can do too much as a designer. You can just go too crazy. And unfortunately, Martin hadn't had the experience as a lead programmer of knowing when to tell a designer to like reel it in. And we signed the game with Origin. So we did have it signed with Origin, but Origin put us in this kind of green light process. So they had this process where you had to get to a certain point, then they'd green light it, and then they'd go for full production. Anyway. The, Martin was finding it difficult for understandable reasons. He'd not, never done lead programming before. Um, but it's, before he got to a stage where we had a really good version working on the C64, Origin said, you know what, we really need it on the PC. 
So then they moved over to the PC, which was another th- lot of stuff for Martin to learn. And um, well, to cut a long story short, I mean, we never really, Martin never really got to the bottom of it. And and Origin lost patience with it. It kind of pulled it and said, okay, we're not going to green light this. And that's what really happened. And then shortly after that, Martin left. And actually then Martin went to join Origin anyway as their sound guy. So, and he's been over in the States ever since. Although a decent football game for the time, Micropro Soccer was overshadowed by 1989's Kickoff, a similar top-down perspective football game that received more favourable reviews. Still, the deal was fruitful for Sensible Software. 1990 saw Sensible Software and the industry in general shift to 16-bit. The Amiga was the obvious choice for Sensible Software. Not only was it the king of home computers at the time, and still is if you ask me, but they had seen success with Commodore's previous computer, the C64. I much prefer to do my work on an Amiga. I mean, I did dabble on the PC, I did paint on the PC, and I hated it. I really, really didn't like it. And I think it's because of the chunky pixels. For me, I always maintained that I'd try and work on the Amiga for all of my work, if I could. You know, and I, I uh, I did do that all the way through. The team also grew, moving into this era of sensible software. Joining John, Chris and Richard Joseph were David Korn and Chris Chapman, who did programming and design, and slightly later Stu Cambridge and Jules Jameson, Stu doing graphics and design, and Jules programming and design. I dabbled on the 64, when I got a, I got a Commodore 128, I think about a year or so later. I mean, my friends had 64s and I desperately wanted a 64, and of course when they announced the Commodore 128, I, I, you know, I thought, well, I'll have that, um, and luckily enough, I got it. My, my parents bought it for me. But I'd been a big fan of like Sensible's games just by playing on my friends' computers, like Parallax and, and uh, you know, like Gal- even Galaxy Birds and things like that, and, and you know, Insects in Space, um, and then Whizball. I started learning assembly language on that, and I never really wrote a, a game on it. I, I did lots of little routines, little demos, and things like sprites and scrolling and that, and I never really got that good where I could put it all together and make a game. Um, but I did one game on the 64 called Battle Ball, which was a shoot 'em up construction kit game. And this is around the time when the Amiga had just been sort of announced. It was like, like coming out, and all, all the press was saying, like, you know, there's this new amazing machine coming out. So I thought, I really want one of them. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd had this game that I'd, I'd sort of put together. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to try and sell this. It's a bit cheeky because, I mean, shoot up construction kit games, they, they all look pretty much the same, don't they? I mean, I know the ones you can see today, they've been hacked quite a lot. Uh, and I thought, I know what, I'll hack the front end a little bit um, and I'll, I'll see if I can uh, <laughs> see if I can sort of sell it to somebody. Like, somebody, you know, someone's gullible, but give me some money for it. And they did. Um, most of them said no. Most of the budget has said no. Like, like Mastertronic said no, and Codemasters said no, definitely not. This is a shoot 'em up construction game. What are you talking about? And then the powerhouse publishing, they were pretty known for some really ropey budget titles. And they said, yeah, all right, we'll have it. And I, went, and I was like over the moon because I thought, hang on a minute, you know, this is a shoot 'em up construction kit game. And they said, no, that's fine. We'll, we'll I mean, they said any old rubbish, I think, in the end. <laughs> and they gave me, they gave me a check. And um, they said, I was really excited. You know, I mean, I was, this is 1987. And I'm like, wow, this is, this is like amazing. So, so I got the check, banked it really, really quickly, which turned out to be a good thing because they went under not long after. But they went under just before they'd done all the box art and the production. And I thought, oh, if only they'd have gone under after they'd you know, released it, then at least I'd have had the physical copy in my hand. Um, that was the only game I've actually had published on my own. You know? um, but that, that allowed me to then save up and get an Amiga 1000 when it came out. And uh, that was the start of like you know my proper sort of foray into video game development. Right. Well, I I had a friend of mine who um, he'd actually had a couple of games released on the 64, and the, and he'd had a game called Armadillo, uh, which was on the by Codemasters. I think they published it. And I was around his house, and I'd, I'd, got, I'd got my Amiga. I'd done sort of you know I'd start using Deep Paint, which was phenomenal at the time. I, I couldn't believe how cool this this software was. So I really started to get into doing pixel art. 
Uh, well, it wasn't known as anything else because it was just art, video game art. There was, wasn't such a thing as pixel art back then. It was just all that, that's all it was. And I bought up a little portfolio. I just had a few portfolio items which I'd just been knocking about with. And uh, I took him around and he, he saw them. He said, oh, this is really good. And he'd got a deal. He'd, he'd, had an Amiga, he'd bought an Amiga 1000 uh, before I'd got mine. And um, he'd got a publishing deal for a game called The Crystal. But he said, I know somebody who's looking for an artist. So I said, oh, he said, well, give us a disc and I'll give it to, to him and I'll see if they, if they want to use you for anything. And that's pretty much how I started. And that company was Impressions, who, who did, you know, they did quite a few different games like Rourke's Drift and they did like Web of Terror, which was awful, um, Final Conflict. They did loads of games. But the first game I worked on was a game called Renaissance One, which was a, a pack of four arcade style games. And it was like Space Invaders, uh, Centipede, uh, Galaxians and Asteroids. And it was literally just two versions. You did like a, a contemporary version, which meant I could do what I like. And then they had like a classic version, which is like homage to the original arcade graphics. And that's pretty much my first published title with on the Amiga, you know. Um, and I did a few titles with them. Built up quite a good portfolio of work. And um, and then one one day I, I was just looking through the, the I think there was a bi-weekly uh, magazine that came out. It was like one of those sort of newspaper ones, like Micromart. And um, just in the back of these magazines, they'd often have job adverts, which for like for game developers and publishers. And I just saw this advert from Sensible Software. And I was like, oh, that's, that's and they're looking for artists and programmers. And I'm thinking, oh, shall, I, shall I apply? <laughs> you know? um, and I undenied about it. I thought, oh, maybe I'm not good enough. You know, I don't know. And I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose. And I was only about, I must have been 19 at the time. And I thought, well, I'll just send it off. And if they say no, they say no. At least I've got, I've not lost anything really other than a disc. So I sent it off and I didn't expect to hear anything. And then lo and behold, like a week or so, two weeks later, I got a, a letter back saying, uh, we'd like to invite you in for an interview. And I went for this interview and, uh, they, they said, all right, well, you know, that was it. And so I think what happened after I went back and they said, you've got the job. Their first release in the 90s was International 3D Tennis, published by Palace Software. Actually, we found the transition really, really easy. We we did a game called International 3D Tennis. It's quite an obscure one. And that was our first totally cross-platform game. So that was Commodore 64, Amstrad maybe even, plus Amiga ST and PC, I think. So it went across 8-bit and 16-bit. Uh, we did the 8-bits internally and the 16-bit was done by a guy called Dave Korn, who, well, he, effectively, he joined our team anyway. That was our first transition to Amiga. And at the same time, we had been working with, on Megalomania. 1991's Megalomania, known as Tyrant's Fight Through Time in North America, was Sensible Software's first truly ambitious title. Part real-time strategy, part god game, it was ahead of its time. 1991 was really early in the genre's life. Westwood Studios' June 2, considered by many to be the catalyst for the genre's popularity, wasn't released until 1992, a year after Megalomania. You choose one of four gods to play as, controlling a tribe of humans as they struggle to survive and evolve. The levels are also split into sets of three, called epochs, with each epoch consisting of three islands. These islands vary in size and shape. The aim is to become the dominating tribe on the island, defeating your opponents to claim the island for your tribe. When selecting a level, you have two strategic decisions to make before you've even started. One, how many tribesmen to send down to the island, and two, where to place them. You start with 100 humans, and the aim is to complete levels using the fewest possible men. The fewer you use, the more that carry over to be used on the next level, so saving as many as possible for the harder later levels is essential. The placement of your tribe will have two consequences. One is the resources available to you, as different squares on the map will yield different resources that you can mine. The other thing to consider is defence. A square that has only one exposed side will be easier to defend than one surrounded by land on all sides. Knowing how many men to use or which square will provide the best raw materials is utter guesswork until you've actually played the level, so it'll take several replays until you master it enough to make informed decisions. Once you're actually down on the island and playing, you have to assign tasks to each of your tribesmen. This can be one of five jobs, mining resources, researching new technology, manufacturing, attacking enemies or defending your buildings. The more technology you research, the more weaponry you discover. 
As your technological prowess increases, you will advance a tech level, complete with a fantastic voice sample to inform you. We've advanced a tech level. As you advance, your civilization advances through time, so you may start off in mud huts or primitive medieval buildings, advancing to modern and even futuristic technology. As well as offensive and defensive weaponry, advancing your civilization also brings with it new buildings which can help you harvest new resources. You need to balance the assignment of tasks, put enough manpower into research and the manufacture of new weapons and buildings, but leave enough to defend your buildings and subsequently attack your enemy's squares. Attacking a square will damage the enemy buildings and once the last building is destroyed, you'll own the square. You can then build your own buildings and build on empty squares. This can be essential, especially if the resources in your initial square have been depleted. Defending works much the same, with you assigning defensive troops to the turrets on your buildings and ground troops to fight it out with invading armies. The ability for your men to do well in battle depends solely on their equipped weapons, so you'll need to make enough of them to arm your army. A tribe with advanced weaponry will easily and very quickly trounce that of an inferior tribe, so you can't afford to get left behind. Another interesting gameplay aspect is that you can form alliances with rival gods whenever the number of enemy gods totals more than one. A proposed alliance will be met with an often hilarious voiced reply from the god, stating whether they accept or reject your proposal. You got it, buster. No, I don't think so. An agreed alliance will ensure that god doesn't attack you for the duration of the pact, and you can use this to join forces against a strong enemy. Alliances can only last so long, as the level can ultimately have only one winner. I think it was the, I think it was the second interview, or the second time I went up there, and Chris Chapman was working on Megalomania. And of course, I'm like a young like fan of Sensible, and I was like, this is amazing. I mean, this is like, I always, I always draw the analogy of like, you know, you're a big fan of someone like Pink Floyd or, or Led Zepp or Van Halen or somebody or Iron Maiden and you're, you know, you're going into the studio to watch them work and you're just like this fan and all of a sudden they give you a job and you're like, this isn't real. Um, so he was working on Megalomania, finishing it off. And uh, I'd bought uh, an Amiga 1500, which was that rebadge 2000 that Commodore UK had released. And I was using that for most of my, my work. And I was just talking to Chris about it, and I said, yeah, he said, what Amiga do you use? And I said, oh, I've got a, one of those Amiga 1500s that just come out. He said, oh, they've got a different configuration of chip RAM than, than fast RAM and, than the normal Amigas. And I said, all right. He said, would you mind testing the game out on, on your Amiga? And I'm like, yeah, of course I will. <laughs> I don't mind. You know, so um, he, he gave me, uh, I think it's, I can't remember if he sent it through the post or he gave me a copy there. I can't, honestly can't remember. But he sent, he gave me a copy of the game that before it had come out just to test. You know, to see whether it'd work all right, and and I was like, wow, you know, and that was it really. And I was in, I was in, I was in the in the Sensi Club. So during that time, there was only like John, John Hare, Chris Yates, and Chris Chapman, who were like working in the office, and uh, that that was me. And then obviously Jules, Jules started with me. We started at the same time, and uh, and that was it really. We was in. They had another artist to do all the title screens and the loading screens, but John done all the all the graphics in game. So, and that was obviously before uh, Sensi Soccer came out. So those little, those little tiny little characters was that's the I think that was like the beginning of it, of that of that look. I think I think from what I remember at the time and from hearing what John said since, it, it was really down to design of the the game. So to get more information on the screen, you know, I mean, I think what's the resolution? Three twenty by two. Five six or something, the Amiga, which is fine back then. But when you've got lots of information, lots of sprites, the only way to do it is to scale them right down. So you you've got a representation of a little man rather than actually a, a nice cartoon version of him. And I think that is purely the reason why why that look kind of evolved and became the the sensey look. One of the highlights of this game is the voice samples, which inform you of your civilization's progress. And as I said, the replies of the rival gods. The designs ready. We've conquered the sector! These voice samples were brought in by Richard Joseph, who again composed the game's soundtrack. When we did Megalomania, he used a guy called Mike Burdett, who also sometimes goes under the name of Jams O'Connell, but he did the voices for Megalomania. I think he also did one of the tunes. He did the, the menu tune with the crazy strings. 
One last gameplay aspect worth mentioning is that there are three game speeds. If you don't want to wait for a particularly long production time or research project, you can speed up time temporarily so time passes quicker. As well as pioneering real-time strategy and resource gathering, Megalomania was the first ever game to feature a tech tree. But it seems that John's plans for Megalomania were even more ambitious than that. But yeah, Megalomania was very, very ambitious when it started. So Megalomania was like, uh, you were flying around in space, firing against other spaceships, 16 different planets. You had like your, your mines and your factories and your towers to defend on the planets. But at the same time as doing that, you had to fly around a spaceship and not get hit. So the same game, 20,000 years into the future with a, you know, a, a space firing game in it as well. So it was really hard. You start in 2500 AD and you go forward in space. Imagine that. So you've got technology, but it's, it's fantasy technology that you're advancing. But also you could fly between the, 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 the 16 zones, you'd fly between them and there would be planets. And you'd have to fly to, to get from A to B to do your stuff. So yeah, really bloody hard. So we decided, because we hadn't advanced it very much, so on the flying part, we would just kind of ditch it. About six months before the game was due to be finished, I noticed, and I never remember it's Populous or Power Monger, but it was a picture of a caveman on a cover. It made me think, instead of having all this spaceship stuff, we could start with a caveman and go forward to like UFOs and spaceships as the final level, rather than just have endless different types of UFOs. Like, it would be more interesting and people would connect more with the history line based on stuff they know like victorians and elizabethans and normans and what have you so that's what we did so we we, we just basically reversed the whole uh, history line so yeah it meant we doing quite a lot of graphics but not too much because we were we'd been a little bit behind with some of the stuff so we'd been working on the the whole megalomania is the first game in the world that had a tech tree we weren't really deliberately consciously making a tech tree but we were working on this thing about mining and designing and upgrading and that kind of stuff and we were doing it almost almost from a theoretical basis at the start so one of the first things was like all the minerals and the names we called them and how they combined to make these different designs so um we just put the graphical world on top of it of this kind of like i say the cavemen and the romans and the boiling oil down the medieval castles and stuff like that and the Victorian biplanes and and then it was a lot more fun to get like to get like a fighter jet flying over I don't know a guy with a bow and arrow it was funny you know? so you got this humor in it and and especially when you got the nuclear weapons it was really funny because then you just race to get a nuclear weapon and just utterly destroy the other guy and obliterate him um that's quite fun you know and uh of all our games megalomania is the one which which kind of it would have had really good legs uh unfortunately it really suffered from mirrorsoft falling apart at exactly the wrong time for the game megalomania started out on the amiga published by imageworks a label under the mirrorsoft umbrella when mirrorsoft collapsed in 1992 megalomania's success suffered greatly as a result, only the Amiga and Atari ST versions of the game were published by Imageworks, with subsequent ports being published by various companies including Virgin on the Mega Drive and Ubisoft on DOS. I'd bought a Japanese Mega Drive on Impul, so I was a huge fan. So when, when, um, when John and Chris said that they're going to do you know, Megalomania in-house, porting it to the Mega Drive, I said, he said, you know, would you be interested in working? I said, yeah, definitely, you know, because it's this was like a time before anything was out about what these machines could do, you know, because I mean, think now, if you look online, you can find information on all the games consoles, you can find out what chips they had them, all the hardware, the programming, you get everything. Well, back then, all that information was, was pretty much kept under wraps. You know, the only way you'd get access to the information is to know a developer who was working on it. And even then, a lot of them were quite secretive because you had to sign NDAs to say, you can't talk about this stuff. So for me, being able to work on something like a Mega Drive was just like, yeah, definitely. Uh, and I loved it. I absolutely loved working on the machine. Uh, and I converted all the um, the whole lot, you know, all the graphics to the Mega Drive. And Jules, uh, he worked on the conversion with me. Uh, and to, between us, we, we kind of worked out the best way to, to get an Amiga game running on a Mega Drive. 
And um, I mean, there was a few things we did, like for instance, the um, like the intro sequence, um, because the original loading screens were 32 color. Well, the Mega Drive can only do 16 colors on a tile at a time. So what we did, we overlaid two play fields and I split the palette into two sets of 16 banks. You had like palette one and palette two, which is like, you know, and then you combine them like that and then you get your, your full 32 colors. But also the screen had to be scaled down. All the graphics had to be scaled down on the intro because the Mega Drive just didn't have enough memory to hold it all in. The thing with the Amiga is the, uh, the original uh, chipset, the OCS chipset, you could have like 16 colors and 32 colors in, in the low res mode. So working on a Mega Drive, you could do it, but you couldn't see all, all colors because the Mega Drive had four palettes in use at once. So you had like 64 colors effectively. Um, obviously minus the zero color because that's black or transparent. Um, but when you got to the AGA chipset, I used the Amiga. I used the Amiga for that. Or P I mean, I did use a PC in some on some of it later on. But you could use an Amiga for doing all your console graphics. You know, uh, so you could do SNES graphics on it um, because it had like you know the AGA chipset obviously had a two five six color mode, which is brilliant for doing that sort of thing on the SNES. I mean, the great thing about the Mega Drive is certainly coming from an Amiga is they've got the same processor, the sixty eight thousand. So the code is identical. I mean, literally, the gameplay code is identical to, to the Amiga version. And the same with Sensi Soccer. You know, the Sensi Soccer code running on the Mega Drive is exactly the same code that runs on the Amiga. It's just all the graphics stuff is different because it's got totally different hardware for doing graphics. You know, I mean, the Amiga's got bitmap graphics and Mega Drive has got sprites and playfields using tiles. So they're all, they're totally different worlds apart in terms of the way they're producing it. Um, but it certainly made conversions a lot easier um, so you could concentrate on getting it to, to run in a way that is solely representative of the original. And I used to get frustrated when I'd see conversions by other people, not of just of our games, I mean, because we did a couple in-house, but you see a conversion of a game on a Mega Drive and you think, well, how can they mess this up? Because it's from an Amiga or it's from an ST. And you think, well, how could they mess this up? Because you've, half the work is there. The code, the gameplay code is already there. But the thing is, part of game development is, is, is getting over that challenge you know it's the challenge of that first moment we're learning assembly language back in the 8-bit days how do I get a sprite on the screen you know and then that moment you see that sprite you think right how can I move it and then when you move it right let's have a scrolling background it's those challenges and overcoming those challenges rather than saying well I can't do that so therefore I'll just bodge it and hope for the best you know and I think that's what made a lot of good developers what they you know that's that's what made them good because they will they would push the boundaries a bit and say well that's challenging but that doesn't mean we can't do it we'll have a go you know um, and I think that that played an important part in, in certain doing conversion work you know to give it the best you know the best you can because people know the original version they know the Amiga version or the ST version so if people want to play that on their console then you should try and deliver the same experience um, so yeah, but I, I really, really enjoyed working on the Mega Drive, and I just wish we'd done more. I'd love to have done more Mega Drive games, really would. Had Megalomania not suffered under the demise of Mirasoft, it would likely get the recognition it deserves today. A sequel was also planned, but this too was a casualty of the situation. After this experience, Sensible Software thought it best to try to spread the risk of a similar situation arising in future by going with several different developers. They had interest from Amiga publishing powerhouse Ocean, Virgin Interactive, and Bitmap Brothers formed Renegade Software. Our game was number one when Mirasoft fell apart, and we were published by Mirasoft, and the whole company just collapsed. It really hurt our company, that, that because when Mirasoft went down, we didn't just have Megalomania signed to it, we had Sensible Soccer signed to Mirasoft, and Cannonfoot signed to Mirasoft and Megalomania 2 signed to Mirasoft. All of our stuff just went bang in one go, like a big crash. Uh, not just us, there's a whole bunch of other developers. Uh, and that 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 period of time for us and a, many, I would say half of the top developers in the UK were signed to Mirasoft. I mean, they, they've done a brilliant job signing us up and it came collapsing down. And then we had some very eye-opening meetings between a whole bunch of us different development companies and um, and the Mirasoft guys telling us that they wanted to retain our rights and they'd do certain things. And then we had people very experienced in business, more than, so than me at the time. Uh, Fergus McGovern from Probe, you know, Probe Software. He was very good. Him and his brother were basically telling them to get lost. You know, we'll do it a different way. 
you know, they helped us development community acts. You had us, the Bear Map Brothers, them, and various loads of other people helped us to get our our stuff back. And then out of that, you had uh, Renegade forming, which was basically the Bear Map Brothers with Rhythm King Records came together to create a new publishing company, which was developer friendly and. So we signed Sensible Soccer after talking to a few other parties. We signed it with, with um, Renegade, and we signed Cannon Fodder with Virgin. Um, and we would have happily signed Sensible Soccer with Virgin, but they said they wanted to call it Virgin Soccer, and we said no, we're not doing that twice. We've already done it with Microprose years ago. This is going to be called Sensible Soccer, um, and that's really was really really the clincher for us, actually. Funny enough, um, it was great working with Renegade and Virgin. They were both great companies. And we survived. I mean, we we had a funny moment where where we went to our bank manager. Bank manager, look, we know we've lost seventy five percent of our turnover, and we're on the floor, uh, but we're really good, and um, we're doing really well in our market. And we've got these two games, and they're going to make us a, a lot of money. And the bank manager, bearing in mind we're back in nineteen ninety one, he said, "Look, you see that floppy disk in your hand? Well, that's worth." 25p and the other floppy disk is also worth 25p so like i can give you an overdraft for 50p what he didn't know is that that disc was cannon fodder and that disc was sensible soccer that's what he didn't know you know and the rest is history their next release was whiz kid in 1992 published by ocean on the amiga atari st and dos although it features quite different gameplay mechanics it was a sequel to Wizball, having the subtitle the story of Wizball 2 and stars a similar ball with a face as the playable character. Gameplay is in principle simple, use WizKid's disembodied head to bash blocks and environmental objects, knocking them into the on-screen enemies. Power-ups can be collected too, with the nose, objects can be juggled and flung in a chosen direction, or with the teeth, single objects can be bitten down on and flung at an enemy for a more precise attack. Bubbles float around the levels revealing coins, the aforementioned power-ups and coloured musical notes. Rather than collecting colours like in its predecessor Wizball, in WizKid you're collecting coloured musical notes. The aim is to complete the musical piece at the top of the screen and upon doing so a tune will play and a shower of coins is released. Money collected can be spent in the shop on various upgrades including giving WizKid a body. But that only really explains part of the game. It also incorporates a lot of wacky mini games and other gameplay elements, including shoot 'em up sections, a crossword, puzzles, and other wackiness and humour that is quintessentially sensible software. Like it or not, WizKid is the result of the kind of unbridled creativity rarely seen in the industry these days. WizKid was the last game me and Chris made together, so it's just a lot of fun doing what the hell we wanted, like freeform jazz. It really was not a commercial game. But we were very lucky that Gary Bracey at Ocean, our producer, really supported us. Like he believed in us creatively. And he gave us a lot of freedoms that we wanted and he backed us up within Ocean. So when you're, when you're making a game as a, as a developer, it's important that within your publishing company that you've got someone championing you in there. Because ultimately they're the guys who pay us. Gary was great at that, so he kind of backed us up and gave us the freedom to do this stuff. And I've got to say, in the long term, when you look at it, People still love WizKid and still talk about it. And we, we're now, that came out in 92, same same year as Sensible Soccer. And we're now nearly 30 years later. Yeah, again, that's a great thing. I mean, it's, it's as a creative person, we were very lucky. We were in our 20s, like quite young, and we're getting a lot of our work is really, really respected. Uh, and as a, an artist, that's very, very satisfying to have that. Um, but there was also another thing going on at that time. So. When we first made our games, like we we didn't feel well, it was only really, really parallax maybe, but we weren't we were getting some attention, but not too much. And then we started to get number one games, and we started to get talked about like we were good developers, and we knew we were dealing with Wizboard and Shop Construction Kit and Micro Soccer and Megalomania. Then people were like, yeah, these guys are consistent. They do know what they're doing. You know, we had 3D tennis in the middle, which wasn't that great, but you know, there's enough mostly quality stuff coming out. But we hadn't really made that much money. And the only game which could have done that was, was Megalomania, which died. So we were like, we, we actually, even when WizKid came out, it didn't really make much money. It was, it was too avant-garde. So Sensible Soccer came out in June 1992. 
Uh, and at that stage, Sensible Software was six years old. And it was, I think, our ninth game. And it's the first one that really made good money. Sensible Soccer was the football game they had always wanted to make, and what they'd always wanted to name it. The first entry in what would become a long-running series was titled Sensible Soccer European Champions. Published by Renegade in 1992 on the Amiga and Atari ST, it was ported to DOS by Wave Software and is perhaps Sensible Software's best-known game. But when Sensible Soccer came, we did make a lot of money. Then, then the floodgates started to open, and that was, that was a big game-changer for us. We started off in Ocean with a 15% of the turnover and a 5,000 advance. By the time we got to Sensible Soccer, it was a 50% royalty instead of 15. And it was, I don't remember the advance, it was 50 or 70 or 90, I can't remember, one, something like that. M might have been 75, something like that. But um, the 50% royalty was the important thing because it was such a big selling game. So. We just got the biggest percentage on the biggest selling game, which meant that the money's coming in, you know, for the first time you're, you're making good money for us personally. So and the, the way we structured our company, everyone in our company was on royalties. So if we did well, everyone did well. So it wasn't just me and Chris making the money. Of course, we made more than everyone else, but we would make sure at least half the money was going to the team. So and, and the, the teams weren't so big. I mean, our lead program was on cannon fodder and Sensible Soccer were earning 30% of the money the games made. Actually, slightly more than me and Chris would have made because we were splitting. But then on the on the um, other formats that they didn't do on the conversions, we would get they would get a smaller percentage and we would keep our our, our share. So I guess in the long run we made out of the the IPs in that that side. It was a really good time. We had a lot of fun. We worked really really hard. I mean we were working well into the small hours every day. But yeah, it was a brilliant time. You know, a lot of fun. Good guys. Good team. Sensible Soccer was the natural progression from Micro Soccer and used the same graphical style as Megalomania with the miniature sprites that became synonymous with Sensi's games. See, a lot of people mistake me for doing the graphics for Sensi Soccer and I never did. I never did any of the graphics for Sensi Soccer. The only thing that appeared in the original Sensi Soccer of mine was the little loading Sensible logo, which is like the 16 color one, which is about like that size. That's the only thing I did because John was working on, on a logo. And I'd done one for Cannon Fodder, and I said, well, you can use mine. And he said, oh, I'll have that. And I gave it to him. I gave him some of this here, use that, and he put that in. And that's the only thing that ever went into the original Sensi Soccer. Um, the only thing I worked on was Sensible World of Soccer, which I did all the crowds, and I did some of the menu graphics and that. Unlike most football games released prior to this, the top-down gameplay had been largely similar. Games like Micropro Soccer and Kickoff, while having slightly different mechanics, had presented a similar experience. At the time, Dino Dini's games were at the top of the tree where football games were concerned, with 1990's Kickoff 2 still being the 16-bit favourite. Sensible Software eschewed the top-down player view for a side-on view of the players, although overall view of the pitch remained top-down. For the football players, they actually used the same sprites as the tribes people in Megalomania, which they had added football kits to in Deluxe Paint, firmly establishing these miniature sprites as a visual style synonymous with Sensible Software. It also felt more visceral than previous games in the genre, providing more satisfying kicks, complete with thuds when the ball bounces or is kicked, and ambient crowd noise is interspersed with chants. Its control scheme proved difficult at first for many, especially those used to playing football games like Kickoff, but once mastered provided a much more skillful and rewarding gameplay experience. The ability to swerve the ball added a welcome depth to the tactics, Sensible Soccer was undoubtedly the most realistic football game to date, and reviews showered it with praise. Sensible Soccer's music was provided by UK punk rock artist Captain Sensible, who wrote a song alongside Richard Joseph. Captain Sensible got in touch with us and said, you're called Sensible and I'm called Sensible and I want to do a piece of music for you. And we went, okay, that's cool. You know, you're Captain Sensible, great, from the damned. But the problem was, he didn't tell us something. He said he'd do it for a pint of beer. We bought him a pint of beer. I gave him a one-page contract, which he didn't sign. I thought, oh, he's a punk, whatever. Anyway, Sensible Soccer came out, did very well. Three months later, we got a letter from music publishing company saying, we are Captain Sensible's music publishers. 
and we own all his music and you're using his music on your game and we want 10 percent of your income we're like well for a start the music's not worth 10 percent of the income like uh, we would pay our music guy four percent for all the music and all the sound of the game in the end we had to pay them ten thousand pounds to make them go away Sensible Soccer saw several iterations. Sensible Soccer 9293 was a tweaked version of the original, again coming to the Amiga and ST, but was also ported to the Acorn Archimedes and numerous home consoles. International Edition came the following year in 1993, again a tweaked version of the original game, and again releasing on Amiga and ST and a few home consoles. Over the years, Sensible Software released some quirky little games and demos on magazine cover discs, in May 1992, their first full game of this ilk appeared on the cover of Amiga Power issue 13, Sim Brick, included on a special Sensible Software cover disc alongside demos of Sensible Soccer and WizKid. Literally the first day I'd started, I did a, um, a cover disc demo for, of called uh, Sim Brick. And because I was young and I wanted to make a really, really good impression, I, <laughs> I thought, I know what I'll do is I'll impress them and I'll work through the night to get this done. There's no reason for me to do it. But I thought, oh. And they left me in the office on my own all night to do it. They, they said, because they were so, I mean, I was thinking to myself, if I could have been anybody, you know, I could have nicked off the stuff, I could have done a runner, anything really. Um, but they, they left me there all night and I said, oh, you know, I'll, I'll stay a bit late and I'll get this, this, this screen done. And I'm doing all the graphics for it. And it wasn't a lot of work really. Um, but I wanted to make it the best I could. So I, 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 stayed, I stayed all night. And um, so that was, the, I suppose, officially, that was the first piece of work I did for Sensible. While calling this a game is a stretch, Sim Brick simulates a brick, and all you can really do is bring a brick into existence, which promptly falls onto an ant, crushing it. You can also view the blueprints of a brick. Largely pointless, but definitely an expression of Sensible's sense of humour. In 1992, Sensible Software were toying with an idea for a game that never came to be, one of many during the company's lifetime, Mirror Signal Manslaughter. This was to be a top-down driving game for the Amiga, in which points would be awarded for causing carnage, for example by running people over. Very much like Grand Theft Auto, which incidentally was also first conceptualised for the Amiga under the moniker Race and Chase. Mirror Signal Manslaughter was a, was a funny one because that never actually existed other than my screenshot. We never actually got to the stage of actually writing any code for it. I think I think Chris Chris Yates did, I can't even remember if he did actually did a demo of it running or something, he, I can't even remember. Um, all I remember is we, they said, oh, we've got this game where you can go around driving into people. <laughs> it's like, okay, uh, could you do a screenshot? And then, you know, the, the premise being that if you do a good screenshot, We'll, we'll take that to a publisher with a, with a design spec and a, a proposal and hopefully somebody will sign it and we'll get a publishing deal. So, um, and that screen was lost for, for many years. I had it on a floppy disk and it, it, uh, I thought it had gone. And if, when we did the, uh, when a sensible book came out, Jules Wills did the uh, conversion for me, converted it back to the PC and he managed to recover the data off of it, which was fantastic. And that screen is, is basically thanks to him because that would have been lost if it wasn't for him. And he, he went through and actually took the disc apart, cleaned it and then managed to restore the data from that. Uh, and that screen only lives today because of him. So I have to thank him again for that because it was brilliant, you know, because that work would, would have been lost. In the end, GTA wouldn't emerge till 1997, so Mirror Signal Manslaughter would have been way ahead of it had it been made. December 1993 saw the release of what is perhaps their most loved game outside of the Sensible Soccer series, Cannon Fodder. Published by Virgin, originally on the Amiga, it was ported to the Atari ST, DOS, Acon Archimedes, Mega Drive, Super Nintendo, Atari Jaguar and 3DO over the following couple of years. Cannon Fodder is a strategy war game in which you control up to five soldiers per level. Again, the signature mini sprites from Megalomania and Sensi Soccer were back, this time in military attire. Development was handled by newcomers Stu Cambridge and Jules Jameson, with Stu doing the art and Jules programming, leaving John to meticulously plan out each level, and this intricate and well thought out level design is apparent. Cannon Fodder was a brilliantly executed game, I'm really happy with Cannon Fodder. 
it was the first game I hadn't done the art on. So I was a bit nervous about managing that. So to counteract that, Stu Cambridge did all the art. I, I drew maps, gridded maps of every level and exactly how things should be laid out and how it should be done. I trusted Stu with the images, but it was more the design side of controlling the design. And, and it was a very, very controlled design. So every level, we introduced something new to the player they've not seen before. It's very systematic because it was me wanting control when I wasn't doing the art. So I went into like a producer designer mode of, you know, uber control. And the result was very good. Jules Jameson did the programming for us, did a great job, really, really good. Cannon fodder was the first one I, I'd started working on. But then halfway through that, we stopped and we did the Megalomania conversion to the Mega Drive. Uh, and then I went back to the, the Cannon fodder afterwards. So, I mean, for John, it was, it was quite difficult for him initially because he was the only artist in the company. So all of a sudden he's got this other guy coming in who's going to be basically doing all the graphics that he would have normally done. So for him, it was, I think it was a bit difficult initially, but he never showed that. I mean, we, we, we got on really well and we still do today. So for me, I mean, I would just do stuff and then he'd say, yeah, that's cool. Or that's you know, not, you know, that's not really what I was had in my head. And we would just kind of, you know, work together and get things done. When it came to level design, we all had a go. Uh, I mean, I think John and Chris done the majority of level designs, but Jules did some, I did some. Um, and then when we had loads of levels, I'm sure we had quite a few that didn't go in. I'm sure we, there's some discs somewhere with a few levels that didn't make it in. Um, and what we did is, is we had like all the levels created and John would go through and he'd have a piece of paper and he would, he would rate them in difficulty level. So while you go through and play and say, well, that one's really easy, that one's not so easy. And often than not, the levels that might have ended up sort of later on would, were, you know, were the ones that might have been developed earlier because they were, but they were too difficult and we would rank them in like difficulty level order. And then what we would do is we'd go through and he would say, right, well, in level three, we're going to introduce, you know, bazookas or, or, you know, in level 10, we'll have a tank. And then you can then get used to using the tank. And then when you get to level 12, you'll need to use it properly because you, you, by that time you should have known how to drive it and use the, the firing of it. So the curve of cannon fodder was literally like that. The learning curve was pretty pretty linear. You know, We got it wrong on a few of the later ones, I think, because I think some of the later levels were really, really difficult. And I think that um, having played a few of those you know, in recent times, I think, do you know what? We should have, we should have like, you know, maybe eased off a bit on the difficulty level. But having said that, I mean, I've had, always had good feedback from people when they, when they talk about it. So maybe the challenge was a good thing on those later levels, you know? <laughs> it's a hard one to, to kind of say, really, because if you make a game too easy, then it's like, well, there's no fun in that. But again, if you make it too difficult, you lose people to, to think, well, I can't be bothered to play it anymore. The game's 72 levels feature several different types of terrain, including snow, desert, jungle and military bases. The layout is often maze-like, with natural barriers like tree lines creating segregated areas and passages. And there's plenty of water, across which the soldiers must swim, leaving them vulnerable to attack. The controls are wonderfully simplistic. Left-click the mouse to move your soldiers to wherever the cursor is pointing, right-click to shoot, and press both mouse buttons together to fire a secondary weapon, like throw a grenade or shoot a rocket launcher. You can control your full team at once, send single soldiers out on their own, or split them into squads. Sending out a scout can be handy, as the area visible on screen is relatively small, meaning that enemies can be hidden just off screen until you move quite near, leaving you open to surprise attacks. This can be especially devastating if an enemy soldier wielding a rocket launcher catches you unawares. The sound design during levels is interesting. There is no in-game music, instead opting for subtle background noise, such as the trickle of water from a river or ambient jungle sounds. This adds to the overall atmosphere of the game, feeling more appropriate for the subject matter. And of course, it makes the sudden onslaught of loud gunfire and explosions and death screens of enemies that more jarring when engaging in combat. As well as enemy soldiers, there are buildings to destroy, a task that is often a mission objective. Buildings can have stores of explosives to collect, so care must be taken not to destroy those, and an exploding building can send its door flying. This is potentially deadly, so make sure your troops aren't in its path. Later levels also add other, more deadly elements to the mix, like gun turrets, tanks and helicopters. 
The level progression is well thought out in terms of difficulty, although there are certain difficulty spikes that are absolutely brutal. Cannon Fodder's design is notable beyond the gameplay itself. The levels are split into 24 missions, each containing several phases. Each mission is introduced with a helicopter animation featuring some nice parallax scrolling. Jules wasn't into the Amiga at all, but he'd, he'd worked on the Nintendo 8-bit, so he'd worked on the Famicom, the NES. So he'd come from that kind of background, and he's, this was his first Amiga project. And so for me, for him, he was learning hard, and I think what he achieved on that on that game is like for first project on the Amiga was like wow, you know, because he just he just he just hammered that hardware, you know, he just did he pushed it to what he could do, and I was I was amazed what he he called me into the office after put this running, and you go, that's amazing, you know. Um, so when it comes to doing this parallax section, I said to him, I've got a really good idea. I said, why don't we have it? Because I'm a bit, see, I'm a big fan of like arcades. And at the time, you had all the big play fields spinning, like the Neo Geo stuff and all the vertical scrollers, and you had all the parallax going past. And I loved all that stuff. And when the Amiga had, I knew the Amiga's got a dual play field mode where you could have two eight colour you know, layers you know, overlapped. I said, I've got a really good idea. If, we, if I draw you like, you know, uh, like a couple of layers, where they overlap, we can do one like that, then that one overlaps there, and then another third layer can overlap there, and it will just basically build up. And because you're splitting it with the copper, you can layer it and have like as many layers as you like, really. And he said, all right, I'll give that a go. So I, done, I, I knocked up the jungle stuff, um, did like some roughs, and he got it working. And it was like, yeah. And then we thought, we'll have the helicopter going off across, and which was a hardware sprite. So we did that. But originally, the helicopter was going to come along, and then it was going to land. And then I think we was talking about having like the guys getting out. But we never did that. We, in the end, we just went straight across. I don't know. I think it was, might have been memory. Perhaps we had memory problems or we didn't have enough memory for it all. But originally, it was going to fly along, like chop lift and come along and then land. And the guys would jump out and then that would be the mission start. Um, but at the moment, it just obviously just goes straight across and then you fades out and then you're into, into the level. One iconic element is the screen in which you select your soldiers. This shows a line of people in front of a hill ready to enlist. After a level, fallen soldiers are honoured, as are any surviving troops who are given a promotion in rank. Fallen soldiers are commemorated with a gravestone on the hill, with the gravestone varying in appearance dependent on rank. This added to the sense of consequence to actually losing a soldier in battle. That and the fact that the soldiers all had unique names, so losing a soldier who had served you well over many missions could be genuinely saddening, a fact that was not unintentional on the part of the developers. It's a very interesting story about how that happened because we, um, I mean, when Jules first put the sprites in, the first, first version of the little soldiers I did, and we put them in, and then I think John and Chris were talking about having like names, putting names in. And we originally was going to have two names. You can have like a surname as well as your, your first name, forename. But we realised that the memory would have been so crazy to have all those different names in. We just dropped it to the first name. But as soon as those names went in, and they went on the panel, the side panel, it totally changed the dynamic of the game. And it was really weird because before that, they were just sprites, soldier sprites walking around. You know, no different to when you play sort of, you know, Commando in the arcade or, or Akari Warriors or something. It's just a soldier. If he dies, you think, oh, all right, never mind. But when those names went in and you see the ranks building up through for several missions and then you die, you think, oh, my God, you know, he's, he's gone. And it really made a difference. And it's weird because you think, look at those sprites. They're tiny, like 12 pixels high or something. Tiny little things. But because in your mind you associate a name, which is a physical person or a real person, to that that little av I suppose, avatar, if you want to call it, then that also makes it a little bit more real, you know. And I think the imagination takes over, and you make a psychological link to a character which doesn't really exist. But because you're associating a name to it, you've got some kind of empathy towards it, uh, and that's quite powerful. And I, I and and I really, you know, I mean, we were talking about it in the office at the time, thinking. That's really weird. I feel quite sad that, you know, one of my little characters, he's, he's been through like four missions and he got hit by a grenade and he's no longer with us. And you think, you know, it, it's, I think it's what made, made the game, again, part of what made the game what it was. These screens honouring the soldiers and the line of potential enlistees are underpinned by some sombre music. This is actually a rendition of a song called Narcissus penned by an 18-year-old John Hare. Touched your hand and felt your softness And in your eyes you light 
That wasn't the only piece of John's music in the game either. The cannon fodder theme, simply called War, was written by John with Richard Joseph, with John singing the lyrics. The team even recorded and starred in a music video for the track, created to promote the game. The video sees the sensible team dressed in military uniform, driving a military vehicle and shooting each other with toy guns. And of course, it's interspersed with some typical sensible software silliness, like a photo of a goat in a soldier's wallet, and throwing darts at a photo of Christian Slater who's been drawn on to resemble Hitler. The song appears on the game's intro screen which features a single poppy. This garnered some controversy as the Royal British Legion took offence to its use, claiming that the symbol was their copyright. Despite cannon fodder portraying an anti-war message in the eyes of the developers and many reviewers agreeing, not everyone saw it that way, least of all the Daily Star. Poppy and cannon fodder we had a, an issue with the Royal British Legion who told us that it was their poppy and their copyright. They made us remove it from the box and they asked us for some money because they thought we were insulting the war dead or something, I, I don't know. We, we paid them 500 quid and I never bought a poppy since, which is a pity because I actually really respect war veterans and stuff, but I don't like companies suing us. The, the Daily Star ran an article on it and some people jumped onto it. And I think the problem was these people hadn't seen the game in context. They just heard, you know, especially back in the early 90s, computer games were still not mainstream. And it was just like young people and their stuff and not respecting us and the cheek of it. What do they think they're doing? Instead of looking at the context in which we put it, I understand why they didn't bother with that because they probably didn't play computer games at all. They just heard the story and went with it. I think that might have been my fault. When they said we were going to have a poppy, I thought that's a cool idea. And I'd, I'd drawn the actual British Legion's poppy that you, you put on your, you know, your lapel or your shirt or whatever. And I just put it on my desk and I taped it to the monitor. I'm like, tape it there on the monitor. And, uh, and I just, you know, let it there and I'm drawing it and went in the game. Didn't think anything else of it. And then of course, somebody thought, oh, that's not good because you're basically, you know, you're glorifying war. That's a bit disrespectful, which it wasn't really because we, when anyone had played the game, you're actually saying, well, actually, war is really bad. It's not, it's not fun. And when you play it, you think, well, actually, it's quite sad to see all your little conscripts and they're all dying. They totally got the end, wrong end of the stick, and so effectively, to cut the long story short, we, you know, we had to change the poppy to the to a, 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 a real poppy. And I went down, I think, where we was based in Saffron Ward, and I think there was a there's a few growing out the side of a wall down the further down. And um, I picked a couple of them, brought them back, taped it to the monitor, sellotaped to the monitor, drew a new one, which is which is the one that ended up going in the game. Um, and, and that was it, you know. Um, but but the thing is, the publicity probably did us really, 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 really good because it got our game noticed for people who might not have known about it. Um, it all kind of it all worked out good in the end, you know. Ironically, despite the Daily Star's claims to the contrary, Cannon Fodder paid, if anything, more respect to the source material than other games. This was without a doubt a boom period for the company, releasing their two most well received and iconic games back to back. Sensible Software had grown in both size and notoriety and were finally seeing some considerable financial success. We had a brilliant size team when we had six people and we were making Sensible Soccer, Cannon Fodder, Megalomania, Wizkid. That was a good era. In those in those sort of early to mid 90s i think sensible that was like that was the team the golden team you know before we got them big and they had loads and loads of people working there on other projects um around when cannon fodder and sensi soccer and swass was was being developed uh megalomania you know that was a brilliant because there was only a group, small group of us um and it was like a load of mates having a laugh you know but professionally so we could we actually got work done um <laughs> and it sounds odd but i wish i'd appreciated that time more than I did at the time because I just took it like that's what I'm doing and I'm enjoying it. Uh, it's only now I look back and I think God that really was a brilliant a brilliant time you know it really was such a great great experience 
You know, I think for me that was the, that was the golden time of Central Software. The team would work hard and play hard. I think Chris went out and bought some radar control cars, and there's like four of them. And this is before we moved to South from Walden. So this is in the, the, the offices in March in Cambridgeshire. And uh, they had this bank. I mean, they had this bank of like rechargeable batteries. It was like this, just the strips of these rechargeable power banks, which we kept recharging the batteries in for these radar control cars. And we were just racing around the car park. And, and where the offices was based, it was the end of a railway siding. So you had like the station, and then you'd have like a siding next adjacent to the station it was, it was in. And there was like this ramp, which must have been used years ago for loading, you know, the freight on, on and off the uh, off the, the, the trains. So we would launch these cars off the ramp and onto the track. And the, 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 this line wasn't used, this siding. It was like all rusty, it wasn't used. We would launch it off. And it's like, this is, and this was like literally a few months after I'd started. So for me, I'm like, this is work. You know, and I remember telling my parents, I'd like phone up and say, you know, oh, what are you doing today? Oh, yeah, I've had some radio control cars. And I'm like, my dad said, well, are you supposed to be working? I said, well, they're all doing it and we're all doing it. So I guess that's part of work. I mean, it goes, I, I laugh and jest about it all, but we all had, we all knew what we had to do. So although we might have gone out and played some control cars or, I mean, sometimes you might go down the pub for lunch, but you knew that, you know, you still had work to do. So when you got back, you know, you just get on with what you're doing, you know, it didn't matter. And I think that's part of the part, part and parcel of working there is that we all had the same kind of ideas of what it is to, 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 to get the projects done, you know. So, so yeah, it was, it was, I think the main thing is a lot of people, it was like managing yourself a lot of the time. If you had that kind of self-management skills, then you got on really well at Sensible. Developing for the Amiga had its advantages, but brought disadvantages when it came to breaking America. You had a lot of American publishers really pushing their American stuff. Americans really do, don't care for European developed software at all. Like there's hardly any games they acknowledge, very few, you know. And a lot of that's to do with the formats that we were leading on. Like we were leading on the Amiga. No one played games on, on Amigas in the States. The real connoisseurs know about our European, primarily British, but also some French stuff or whatever. They're the only guys who know about it. Most of them, all they know, knew was like a, a Nintendo systems, and a PC. That's it. So what you find is the games that were very strong on the PC, actually some of the Bullfrog stuff, particularly from that era, they were strong on the PC. They tended to do better in the States than those of us like us or the Bitmap Brothers who focus more on the Amiga and the ST. We tend to do very well in the UK and France, Germany maybe, but we never made that transition so well out to the States. And the other companies that did well at that time were the ones who were working on the Nintendo formats. But we noticed uh, very clearly with cannon fodder. I've always understood why Sensible Soccer didn't sell in the States. It's a football game. But why didn't cannon fodder do well in the States? Um, like I say, it's only, it's only cannon fodder that really gets to me. To a certain extent, Megalomania as well. Megalomania is a game which could have done well in America. Sensible Soccer received numerous appearances on demo discs over the years. Notable highlights were Sensible Soccer meets Bulldog Blighty on Amiga Power issue 21 in January 1993. This version pitched England against Germany, but replaced the players with soldiers from cannon fodder and hilariously substituted the ball with a grenade that would periodically explode, killing any nearby players. Unsensible Soccer on the cover of Amiga Action issue 42 in March 1993, this was a wacky take on the game, allowing the player to control teams of fruits instead of players. And Canon Soccer on the Christmas 1993 issue of Amiga Format, issue 54. This blended sensible soccer with cannon fodder, featuring gameplay elements from each blended together, complete with festive messages from sensible software. I mean, even when we did cover discs, which were often a pain to, to develop, you know, because they were often quite last minute, you know, they'd come in and got to do a cover disc for a magazine. I'd often curse about doing those because I was usually busy doing graphics on, on you know, cannon fodder or whatever game was doing. But even now, I look back, I think, yeah, they were they were good to do because they're again part of that sensible history and that part of the what made us what we were. You know, we did loads of cover discs to get the, the demos out. I mean, there was no there was no point there where I, I didn't enjoy enjoy working. There was no I mean, the highlight was all of it really, if I'm honest. If that's a bit cliche, I don't know.
Around 1993-94, another cancelled project was being worked on, Molotov Man for the Super Nintendo. This was to be a Bomberman style game, but the character tosses Molotovs rather than bombs. As with Mirror Signal Manslaughter, it seems to have been scrapped very early on, as again, only a few mock-up images exist. Molotov Man was for the Super Nintendo, and again, I was over the moon about working on that, because Chris had got the dev kit in, uh, in, in, the, in the office, and he was playing around with the snares. And then he was talking about doing like a Bomberman style game. And, um, and the idea is you just threw Bonnetoff cocktails around, which is obviously like the bombs. But it wasn't quite the same as Bomberman. It was like that kind of idea, but it was like sidetracked a bit to something slightly different. Um, and he said, do you want to not, you know, come up with a character and some sprites and some tiles and we'll try and get a publishing deal with it. So, and there is actually a demo of that, which I haven't got. But there is a demo that was there was a couple of demos of that created um so you could actually play it and i remember because i remember seeing it in the office and he'd got like me explosions in he'd got like all the um but that I, I managed to get some sprites done i got the main character done and i got some tile set graphics done for that uh, and that was looking pretty nice because we you know with the snares you had like 256 colors you know in the tile set if you wanted and it was really really nice to work on you know yeah. just to show the resolution was a bit naff mm -hmm. snares had a I think, 256 wide pixel display or something which was a bit bit naff really you know i think if they'd have gone to 320 it would be much better um, because converting between the snares and the, and the and the mega drive was a bit of a bit of a pain because you, you lost your resolution a bit there were a couple of other minor projects that were started and not completed during these years but these two were the most notable there are two more cancelled games of note later in the company's life, but we'll get to those in due course. 1994 saw the release of Sensible's crowning glory, Sensible World of Soccer, commonly known by the acronym SWOS. Published on the Amiga by Renegade and ported to DOS the following year, this was a hugely ambitious sequel to Sensible Soccer. SWAS built on the core gameplay established with its predecessor, but added football management gameplay elements, a genre which was hugely popular at the time. Players could guide their chosen team through 20 seasons, buying and selling players by means of a transfer system that allowed the purchase of players from other teams via trades or the exchange of money, or a combination of both. A player's value was calculated based on their performance across several attributes. It also ramped up the scale to 11, including real-world data from across the globe. The extensive research was done by Mike Hammond, longtime editor of the European Football Yearbook, and featured a staggering amount of team and player data. The end result was a whopping 1,500 teams and 27,000 players in the game. Want to play as some obscure team or player from a tiny unknown team in South America? Well, with SWAS you can. The design was, as with its predecessor, done by John Hare, with Stu providing additional graphics. I never did any of the graphics for Sensi Soccer. The only thing I worked on was Sensible World of Soccer, which I did all the crowds and I did some of the menu graphics and that, and some of the, like, the uh, other bits and pieces that appeared, like the crowds and that. Sensible World of Soccer was highly praised by reviewers, with most rating it well into the 90s. It was named Amiga Power's greatest game of all time and featured on GameSpot's list of the greatest games of all time. It also featured in Stanford University's list of the 10 most important games of all time, sitting among industry greats such as Doom and SimCity. It's not only the only sports game on the list, but the only game developed in Europe. World Championship Soccer 2 was released in 1994 on the Mega Drive and Genesis. This was published by Sega and was a follow-up to the original World Championship Soccer from 1989, which was renamed World Cup Italia 90 in Europe on the Mega Drive. Unlike the original's top-down perspective, this sequel was played from a side-on viewpoint. Many people aren't aware that Sensible Software even developed this as their logo is absent from both the box and the intro screen. The box just displays Sega branding, with the intro screen showing the Sega Sports logo. We did um, a, a secret project, which isn't so secret now, for Sega called World Championship Soccer 2. And I think that's called the, oh, who, who was I can't remember, the something, the Cooks or something. Mystery Chefs. That was a rehash of the Sensible Soccer engine with different graphics, which was quite a funny thing to do. So I guess we did have another another game out there in, in that kind of mold, which was slightly more bigger graphics and slightly more appealing to, to that side. That was a kind of like, yeah, it was a kind of... Um, it's extra bit of way to make some money, should we say. 
but that was running the Sensi Soccer code. Um, that was actually Sensi Soccer running behind that. All the gameplay code for Sensi Soccer was in that because obviously the Mega Drive's the 68,000 processor. So Chris Yates ported that. I don't think it plays as well as Sensi Soccer because the angle's been changed and the perspective's changed. So it's not quite the same kind of dynamic. But I think the, the basic gameplay is the same in terms of the functionality of the, of the controls now are pretty much the same. I had to use the sprites, the same number of sprite frames for the bigger sprites. And they're sight and they're much more they're like FIFA sprites. They're big actually bigger than the FIFA sprites. So imagine you've got to do an animation, it's like <laughs> it looks a bit a bit naff. But I had there was no memory. It was like that's what you've got to do, and that keeps it in with the code, because he wouldn't have had to change loads of code. So I, I was a fan of Love I asked him the T V show Lovejoy. So all the players in the World Championship Soccer Two are modelled after Ian McShane's Lovejoy. <laughs> So you've got like a basically you've got a team of Lovejoys playing against a team of Lovejoys. They've all got the dark hair and the mullet. <laughs> but um, but I like, again, it was a Mega Drive, so it was a brilliant, brilliant title to work on. I really enjoyed working on it. And we did like I did all the menu graphics. There was like flags that, that circled around and um, all the menus and and I liked all the, the things that came in when you when you scored a goal. We had the great big arcade style letter in, which I did. Loved all that stuff. You know, um, to me, working on the Mega Drive was like working on a an arcade machine you know the way it felt you know it had the same hardware effect as some of the arcade machines it's the same kind of ideas and uh, i really enjoyed it but i just it just wish it was a shame it was just a shame that people didn't realize that that was us that created that game it's only now that it's coming out that that was our project we did that you know and i don't know why they kept it a secret i don't understand what the reason i don't know i don't know if it was must do contractual reasons i don't know I don't know if it, it, it would seem to me that it would have been a Sega decision, but I don't know. All I know is it was a secret project, and Chris said to me, like, oh, you know, we've got this project, this is like a secret project, um, and uh, it's with Sega, and that's it. So for me, I didn't really care, because I just did love doing the work. You know, I love doing the graphics, I love doing the animation, uh, I love my arcade games, and I love the Mega Drive. So for me, it was like, yeah, I don't really care, I'm just happy to do it. The other big release in 94 was Cannon Fodder 2 in November, a sequel arriving a mere one year after the original. This was again published by Virgin, but was only released on the Amiga and DOS. The game starts off much the same as the original, but some strange design choices start to make you suspicious. For one, the iconic hill is now made of what looks like moon rock. What is going on here? This is even more confusing when you're dropped into the mission and find your soldiers fighting in surroundings indicative of Desert Storm. But soon enough it gets weird, and you find yourself fighting on alien spaceships and other planets. As if that wasn't strange enough, you then find yourself taking on gangsters in what looks like 1930s Chicago, and knights in medieval times. And no explanation for any of this is given. At the mission start, you're dropped in by a spaceship, complete with a remade version of the helicopter animation from Cannon Fodder, so we can assume the aliens are transporting you through time, I guess? A little exposition would have been nice. The main reason for this huge departure in design was that the levels were designed by Stuart Campbell, a video game journalist who had written for Amiga Power from 91 to 94. The game clearly suffered from the absence of John's meticulous planning present in the first game, resulting in a far less enjoyable and less progressive difficulty curve. Cannon Fodder 2 becomes brutally difficult very quickly, and this became one of the main sticking points for its critics. Cannon Fodder was a brilliantly executed game, I'm really happy with Cannon Fodder. And then we did Cannon Fodder 2, but at the same time as we were doing Cannon Fodder 2, I was really heavily focusing on SWAS, on Sensible World of Soccer. I didn't have time to have the level of input and focus I normally would, and um, suggested that we got another guy to do it. Stuart Campbell came on board with us, who wrote for Amiga Power and was a good friend of ours, and I knew he loved our games and, and knew he knew our stuff. And Stuart did an okay job, but he obviously wasn't experienced at the level I was or whatever. It was on the same engine, so the levels are kind of the same, so it kind of play the same. Although it could be, some people say it's a bit hard, it's set up hard. The feeling of being in a world which resonated with real world war and being in like the Vietnam War kind of feeling and the naming of the levels and these small details had moved. Now you're in an alien world and it's kind of moving a little bit away from the universe we created. And that lost a bit in the game. That's where the game lost something in it. It wasn't a disaster, but whereas Sensible World of Soccer took Sensible Soccer forward, Cannon for the 2 took Cannon for the back a step. It's not a bad game. 
it's, it, it's, a, it's a pretty good game, actually. It doesn't have the X factor Cannon Fodder has. It didn't have all those bits like the, the music and the and the and the feeling of people dying in war and the great gameplay and the every level something new is opening up and it, it just something was missing in it, you know. And that's my fault for letting go of it. I mean, I let go of it because I didn't have enough time to do everything. And it's not Stuart's fault. He did a pretty good job and the game did very well, really. But you can just feel that something has been lost a bit. One reviewer, Jonathan Maddock from Amiga Computing, lambasted the garish graphics on the alien levels, stating whoever chose the colour scheme should be put away in jail by the Department of Bad Taste. Although it's widely regarded as a miss these days, Cannon Fodder 2 reviewed quite well at the time, mostly receiving scores between 80 and 90. Not from Jonathan Maddock though, who gave it 71% overall, stating that it felt more like an expansion to the original than a sequel. Most negative comments from reviewers focused on the game's difficulty and the bizarre thematic choices. The final notable release that year was another Sensible Soccer cover disc for Christmas 94, Sensible World of Moon Soccer, featured on the cover of issue 65 of Amiga Action. The football matches here are taking place on the moon, with ball physics simulating the lower gravity. Perhaps the team bit off a bit more than they could chew this year, spreading themselves too thin, although Sensible World of Soccer is arguably their crowning glory in terms of ambition and scale. Over the next two years, Sensible World of Soccer received three updated versions, all of which, like the original, were released on the Amiga and PC and published by Renegade. It's worth noting that Renegade were bought by Time Warner in 1995, but still published as Renegade. Sensible World of Soccer 95-96 in 1995, which added some small but welcome gameplay tweaks, new menus and team data. 95-96 Championship Edition in 1996, which was the same game but with a preset Euro 96 competition, released to coincide with Euro 96. And Sensible World of Soccer 96-97, also released in 1996, which contained updated team and player data. Sensible Golf was also released in 1995 on Amiga, published by Virgin, coming to DOS in 1996. A golf game based on the Cannon Fodder engine, this would be their final commercially released game for the Amiga. This one featured another theme tune written by John Hare. At face value this should be a fun golf game. It has all the usual elements you would expect, including a power meter for adjusting your swing. It featured a full golf season with all the major tournaments and a decent 25 courses. And the presentation is pretty good. Sadly, the depth just wasn't there, resulting in a somewhat shallow experience. Jules, who was doing Cannon Fodder 2, was doing sensible golf programming at the same time, using the same engine. The Cannon Fodder engine was never purposed to write a golf game. We thought we could get away with it, but then quite late into the development, we, we realized there's certain things we couldn't do animation wise with the engine we wanted to do. To We wanted a lot more humor in sensible golf. It was meant to have people taking the piss out of each other for missing shots and stuff. And, you know, kind of like Mario Golf, a bit more social, but with a bit more of an edge. But we couldn't do these things because of technical reasons. And I found I find the game very dry and almost like an uncompleted painting or something. It's like there's something missing from it. Again, it's not bad. Some people really love it, but I find it hard to see that game. And um, we signed up with Virgin and they paid good money for it. And I don't think we ever gave them quite the value for with that particular game. Sensible Golf would be Stu's last project at Sensible before leaving to form his own company. I mean, it was modeled off to some of the um, arcade golf games. Some of the sprites weren't actually finished uh, when it came out. Overall, I was pleased with the look. Um, I'd like to, you know, when you, you go into your first start and you've got that little little hut at the side and you've got a little man he's standing. I wanted that to be animated so you'd see him walking on, but we just didn't have time to do that. Um, and I wanted to do a few of those where you'd see him walking from like, you know, along the, the side. Didn't get that in. The sprites for when he's putting, they weren't finished. So they're actually unfinished sprites that went into that one. They're, they're, they're functional, but I look at them now and I'm thinking they're awful because they weren't, I'd never finished a 
the look of them properly. Um, but overall, I think it, it was okay. It just didn't have that polish, you know, didn't have the polish that we needed. You know, I mean, I'd like to have had like bunny rabbits jumping out of the bushes and, you know, a few, I mean, a little squirrel poking his head through, just little things like that, you know, maybe like a fish jumping out of the water, all those things you expect to see on like a console game. But we just didn't put them in. So unfortunately, although it's quite a good game if you've got a few people playing it, the single player game isn't is isn't as good as I think it could have been. But we did what we could in the time we had, you know, and that's that's all we could do, you know. Um, I'd love to have gone back to it and done another version, you know, but that that would never have happened given that the sales weren't as good as as our other games. It was a shame that Sensible Golf was Sensible Software's farewell to the Amiga, a system that had given them a flourishing partnership during the first half of the 90s. Longtime Sensible Software supporter Amiga Power lamented the fact that this would be their last Amiga game, giving it a very low 66%, although most magazines did rate the game above 80. They did however release one more game on the Amiga, albeit not commercially, Sensible Train Spotting. This was another quirky little game exclusive to a magazine cover disc, appearing on issue 53 of Amiga Power in September of 1995. This was a simple train spotting simulator in which players check off trains as they pass on a sort of train bingo card, pressing the relevant square as the corresponding train passes. The first half of the 90s was undoubtedly a golden era for Sensible Software, before the industry and the company itself would begin to change tack. Once we moved to Saffron Walden and we ended up with having like, you know, offices that had like a, a ground floor, a first floor and a second floor. And then they took the offices next door to house a, a rendering farm and artists to do all the 3D stuff. The place just changed. You know, you, I mean, I, I remember a few times I'd go downstairs to the kitchen to make a coffee and uh, there'd be people in I didn't know who they were. You know, they were artists who they took on to do the 3D modeling. I had a, didn't have a clue who they were, you know, and they didn't have a clue who I was. You know, um, and that kind of changed, you know, the dynamic of the place changed. It meant John Hare and, and Chris Yates weren't involved in a lot of the, the stuff that they would have been involved with, with, with the, you know, the 2D stuff that he was working on, the Amiga stuff. And, you know, again, the, it lost that dynamic, you know, because I'd often like, you know, if I was working on, on something, John would come in and he'd, he'd, you know, he'd have a talk about things and he'd look at it and he might suggest something. The whole dynamic of the place changed. And that was the time when I thought, this isn't going to last for much longer because I kind of sensed that this wasn't happening, uh, which is why I decided to leave, you know, which was a tough decision because, you know, I could have stayed, but then I think, well, how long am I going to be staying for? Because if the company goes, what's going to happen to me? You know, I best to try and do something now while I can. But I, I'm, I'm appreciative of the fact that I got that job. Of course, by 1995, the transition to 3D in the gaming industry was in full swing. Yes, friends, I'm talking about this. It may look like a harmless bagel toaster, but inside is a deadly donut. Sorceress came out in 1994. That's the game that got lauded, that got in this canon of the 10 most influential games of all time, blah, blah, blah. So we were really, really worth a lot. And that's when we get to 95 and we could have sold our company then, but we didn't want to. We wanted to do what we did, sign deals up with the publishers. We had, we tended to go back to the same publishers for a few games rather than just do one and then jump around. But we always tried to have a few on the go. And we've had a very successful era working with Renegade and with Virgin, and to a lesser extent with Ocean sitting in the background with WizKid. You know, after the Mirosoft experience, we were like, we're never going to do that again. We're going to keep our, our net spread wide so that if one of our publishers, one of our sources of income collapses, at least another one is alive. Because we realised from the Mega Rain experience how close we were to death as a company. But then we got to a stage where we had, we were basically caught in a fight between Virgin and, and, and Renegade. Well, Renegade, Renegade sold their company to Warner. So it now became a, a Warner thing. And we were just caught in a war. Like both, we, we said to them, right, we're going to do three games. We're going to do the next Sensible Soccer, but it's going to be 3D. We're going to do this Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll adventure game thing. And we're doing another game called Have a Nice Day. And they really wanted us. And they, basically it was a million pound a game advance. And we wanted to keep it split, but neither of them wanted us to be able to do that. They both wanted all of us. Both parties would only do the deal if we did all the games with them. I had to negotiate with both sides and then we had to make a decision. In the end, we decided to go with uh, Warner. But the main reason we went with Warner is because most of our money was coming through Warner on the Sensible Soccer royalty. Sensible Soccer was outselling Cannon Fodder. 
and we knew that whoever we didn't sign with would be pissed off with us for a while and we we couldn't afford to jeopardize that sensible soccer income so now we had all our eggs in one basket again we did have still royalties coming in from cannon fodder and virgin were always good at honoring that and fair play to them and some people at virgin like sean brennan who we loved he was a great marketing guy and tim cheney there was a publishing person it was it's really sad to let people down i have to say no and it, the worst meeting business meeting i ever did was going in to tell uh sean that we had to turn them down now they were offering us millions and millions and we were going no we don't want it we're gonna go with someone else they must have felt terrible yeah so we we in the end we went with warner and uh, then we started on making these new games but there was a catch in these million pound advances so our deal was brilliant our deal was brilliant because we basically got paid regardless of what we did so it was so in our favor it was ridiculous but the catch was we had to make games in 3d which nowadays sounds like nothing but in those days we're back in 1995 and a bunch of people were still working on 3d had started working on 3d by then but in sense we'd never touched 3d you know, we, we were the top developer in Europe on 2D machines, on the old 16-bit machines. But the market was changing, and the reason we were getting off with big advances is we were cool, because we were kind of being coerced into going 3D. We were offered like four times more money than we would have got to stay 2D. And the market was kind of dying, you know, that 2D market was dying, which is fine, but the problem we had was that we didn't have the experience internally to work on 3D. So we'd assumed that sensible, we, we'd hit this gold patch where everything we did turned to gold, everything we touched turned to gold. So we thought, oh, that's easy. We've already done the 8-bit to 16-bit transition and that was extremely smooth and easy. It's just going to be the same. Unfortunately, it took us about a year to learn. It wasn't at all the same. <laughs> In November 1996, Renegade, after having been merged with the European division of Time Warner Interactive, was sold to GT Interactive, who hoped the deal would grant greater access to the European market. Sensible Soccer went 3D in 1997, with the release of Sensible Soccer 98 on PC, published by GT Interactive. Judging by a promotional video recorded at the time and a review of the game, this was at one point planned to be called Sensible Soccer 2000. Initially released in Europe for DOS and Windows, it came to North America the following year and received a PlayStation version exclusive to Europe in 1998 called Sensible Soccer 98 European Club Edition. Sensible Soccer did not transition to 3D gracefully. Critics applauded the team customization options, but hated the gameplay. The competition was just too strong at the time, with EA's FIFA series being several years in at that point, so the simple fact was that there were better football games out there. In the end, this was the only game of the three in the Warner deal that Sensible Software made. The other two were Have a Nice Day, aka Office Chair Massacre for the PlayStation, and Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll for the PC. It seems that Sensible Software hadn't learnt their lesson after taking on too much with Cannon Fodder 2, Sensible World of Soccer and Sensible Golf, a choice which, as we saw earlier, resulted in two of the three projects suffering. The problem was we needed to employ more programmers, and we needed to employ 3D programmers, which we'd not done before. But we didn't really have experience in, in working with these people. And what that meant was there was a lot of bullshitters out there. And we went through a number of programmers who said they could do something but it turned out they couldn't really do it or they were overplaying their hand particularly with sensible soccer 3d my god that was such a problem like finding someone who could execute it to a reasonable level that was you know it's kind of frustrating that like sex drugs and rock and roll for example and sensible soccer we had really good games and we had programmers who were woefully inadequate to do that their part of the job so uh sensible soccer on the on the the management side and everything you know, we had Chris Chapman doing it, it was great and controlling that and keeping it together. But on the 3D side, we didn't have the right programmers there to execute what was expected of a game that was the top selling football game in the world at the time. We hadn't really come across a programmer that couldn't do their job. And all of a sudden we had three of them sitting in the office at once, you know. And and the problem with programmers, it takes you a while to suss them out. And one of them particularly was just a, a brilliant bullshitter at telling you what he was doing and just like I said, there to take the wages to play the game, not thinking about the long-term consequences on the game itself. The worst period of game development was that period. In that whole period preceding 3D, like the whole 8-bit and 16-bit 
period. If you had to say how we divided our time in terms of game making in the office, roughly 25% of the time was spent managing the machine side. In other words, making sure it was technically everything was running properly, managing the way that you're using the memory and stuff like that, the way you're displaying graphics on the screen, all those kind of things, which was important on the Commodore 64 and, and the Amiga. It, it was absolutely critical on the Commodore 64, but it meant that 75% of the time we could spend on crafting the game, making a great game. As soon as we moved to that early 3D, it totally flipped around. 75% of the time was spent just making the graphics appear on the screen. Like, I remember the first year and a bit of sensible soccer, there wasn't a game. There weren't footballers, there weren't graphics, there were not players. You go from a game which is where you're spending most time really refining and making the game great, to just making the graphics appear. The problem with making games is that your lead programmer is the king, because if he messes up, everyone else's game just falls to pieces. You can get around having a weak artist or a weak designer or you know, a weak producer, but a weak lead programmer, everything literally technically just collapses. And unfortunately, we had that happening simultaneously with all three games. Chris was kind of struggling a bit with Have a Nice Day, which he was doing. Have a Nice Day, which was for the PlayStation 1. That was another one that's, that, that, that just didn't go anywhere. I worked on that one. Um, that was involved, you was in an office chair and you'd basically go around shooting everybody in the office. <laughs> Well, you know, driving around in your chair. Um, that was a 3D game, um, but that didn't didn't really go. Anywhere. And again, there is a demos of that available somewhere, but I don't I don't know where they are. You know, I think they must be an archive because I think they they'd be quite nice to see those again, even though they were quite early. Uh, it, just just for historical facts, just to see them again. Me and Chris had this uh, joke game that we've been talking about for years, which was Office Chair Massacre. The, the premise of the game was simple. It would have been about 1991, maybe, we had this idea. And basically the idea was that you're sitting in, a, in, a, in an office chair with wheels on the bottom that spin around and with arms. And then strapped to the arms are these two guns. And as you fire the guns, it pushes you backwards with the recoil. So you've got this jet propulsion on the guns firing forwards to push you back. And actually I, I noticed Last year, I think someone's actually made a game where you do this as a movement mechanic. So it's actually been published many, many years later. We're talking about, God knows how many years. 30 years later, it comes out or something. Anyway, but there's a really good off Office Politics parody. A bit like Megalomania, you've got four factions, red, green, yellow, and blue. And they represent four guys who are the vice president of whatever, vying with each other to become the president of whatever, or the senior vice president. In order to get promotion in their company, they have to outdo their rivals in terms of how many sales they get or what the bottom line is, you know. They'll fire themselves around this place. Obviously, they're trying to shoot the other guys with their enemies. But they're also entering rooms of, I don't know, a sales team. And then they basically got to terrorise the sales team into working for them instead of the other guy. So they go into the sales team and then they, they like maybe shoot someone or whatever. And then the rest start working for you. And then once you've got control of them, Saving the sales office, you'll go, right, I want you two to just be doing as many sales as you can. And the third guy, you're just going to be guarding the door. And as soon as anyone comes in, you're going to, you're going to shoot at them. So you're kind of like managing your troops within the office. And then after X amount of time, you've got a sales target. And whoever of the three, the four managers hits the sales target wins the level. And you get the promotion. The next um, office, you go up a level. So now you've got sales, but you've also got a buying team. So you've got a buying team and a selling team. So you've got the buying team to buy the product in so the sales team can sell it out. So now you're gonna manage two different sorts of worker for you with this same colored faction thing. So it's slightly more complex, you know, like the red guy might be dominating the buying, but your guy is yellow, he's dominating the selling and you know, this kind of stuff. I can't remember if you could do allegiances with people and then break them like Megalomania. I can't remember that, that part of it. Anyway, then the next part, a marketing team. So you need the marketing team, then they push the sales. Then you've got a legal team, which tries to get money in by suing people. And then you've got an accounts team, which tries to fill the, the way it's going through. So you end up with this just office, it's an office politics, politics parody, basically, based on ter terrorization and guns and fun. Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll was a similarly silly concept, initially known as Drugged Out Hippie starring a wannabe rock star called Nigel addicted to various recreational drugs. 
a point and click adventure game, the story would follow the aspiring rock star as he played gigs and dealt drugs in order to pay off a debt with the Hells Angels. The drug taking would actually alter the character's abilities, for example taking speed would actually speed his movement up. Quite controversial, especially for the mid 90s. Like in Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll's case, we had 10 artists working on it. So you've got 10 artists and you've got me as a designer and you've got myself and Richard Joseph doing the sound on it and th there's a lot on that. And a couple of guys making videos all the time as well. And, and then it's going through one lead programmer who's not doing the job. It was a really weird time because I think that we we were late to the party with 3D. You know, we we were struggling to get a 3D system in the company. You know, there was no there was no 3D engine, and um, with the PlayStation, there was not. We, I think we was too we was too late to it to get something out before the company suffered. And uh, I I never really got into 3D. I did some I did some low poly 3D modelling and and a few basic stuff, but I never really took to it. I, I just didn't enjoy doing 3D art. Um, I prefer doing like proper illustrations and, and digital art and pixel art, I prefer doing that sort of stuff. To me, it was like the death of Sensible, really. You know, I mean, we did, I think they did. See, I left around, I, re I left not long after Sensible Golf come out. We, uh, I, I think that when they released the 3D Sensi Soccer, which I believe wasn't very good, it was okay, but just wasn't the same sort of game. Um, I think that's when it all kind of started to go a bit downhill, you know, and it's a shame, you know. Um, and obviously there was Sex, Drugs and Rock and Roll, the game, which which basically consumed all the resources of the company at the time, you know. I mean, they it, it really, really did. And that wasn't even 3D. That was 3D rendered, you know. That wasn't using real-time 3D. Uh, but again, you know, getting good 3D artists at that time, it was still fairly new skill set. So, you know, there's plenty of people doing it, but out of those people doing it what percentage of those can do it commercially to a standard that is required for a video game you know so there were there was a lot of problems i believe gt interactive were not thrilled with the themes especially the main character's drug addictions and other controversial subjects like prostitution in the end the subject matter was just too much for gt interactive to stomach and the project was abandoned in 1998 when gt interactive cancelled both this and have a nice day most likely to the relief of sensible software. Codemasters bought sensible software in 1999 along with its IPs, giving the team the way out they by that point desperately wanted. John carried on working closely with them on Sensible's games. Sensible software was a, was a very special time, you know, we were so lucky. We we Two thirds of our games were number one hits. We had a lot of fun. Even for me, between periods like after that, then I worked for Codemasters for three years, which was a lot of fun when we sold our company to Codemasters. And then we set up Tail Studios in 2004 with Mike Montgomery and John Phillips and the Bitmap Brothers. I set that up. That was fun. We did mobile versions of Sensible Soccer and California that did well. And then um, I did a whole bunch of consulting for different companies in different countries. So I've been in in the Ukraine, I've been in Turkey and in, in Poland. John is currently working on a spiritual successor to Sensible Soccer, Sociable Soccer. And currently I'm in Finland working with Combat Breaker and Sociable Soccer, which has been great, that's been five years. And that's actually going really well. So with Sociable Soccer, we're, it's cross-platform, but at the moment it's only out on Apple Arcade. And so we are just working on all the other platforms and but for, for different reasons, it's gone a bit slower than we wanted. But it's fun, you know, it's good to be making a decent football game again. Uh, and, and in a way, it's nice to, well, that's frustrating for everyone else that it's only on Apple Arcade and most people haven't got it. For us, it's good because it means we can iron out the creases in the game on, on Apple Arcade before we put it on the other platforms. So if anyone is watching this and wondering where the hell is your game on these platforms you promised five years ago. But yeah, so we're, we're in a position now. We uh, have been called by Pocket Gamer the best arcade football game on mobile. And we're... You know, we're slowly developing what we're doing with our game and making it a better and better and better game. You can look at the Apple Arcade page if you want. So Sociable Soccer on Facebook, or you can go to Twitter. They're probably the two, you know, the, the, the easiest ones to follow. Sociable Soccer succeeds where a 3D Sensible Soccer never did. It's coming to consoles in the first half of 2022, so keep an eye out for that. And their website is linked below.
You can keep track of what Stu is up to at his website, thedesigndroid.co.uk, where he sells some of his fantastic pixel art prints and canvases. If people want to go to thedesigndroid.co.uk, so I've been doing that, and that's really just a, a thing that um, I set up just so to give me a focal point to create new art. Um, because being a commercial artist, you, you're always busy working on other people's projects or people or projects that you're you're working with people on. But personal stuff, you never get a time to do. It's like, but if I know I've got somewhere to to do it for, like you know, like a website I'm feeding with with content, then I think, okay, I can put that on the shop or I can do that, and it just gives me that little incentive to to actually get off my backside and draw something, you know, because I'm quite um. I'm not. It's it's just sound odd, but I don't I don't sit and spend loads of time drawing. You know, I'm you know I'm I'm you know I'm fairly capable. I'm I'm not you know I, it's not like I can't draw anything, but I tend to be so busy doing stuff for other projects. I just don't get the time to sit and just be leisurely draw. You know, and I'd love to have that time. So that's what the design draw is all about. And I've got like you know, you can get your own pixel portrait on a canvas if you want. And I'm working on different backgrounds now, so you can have like you know different circuitry for like Commodore 64, Amiga. I could do an ST1, ZX Spectrum. Oh yeah, that's that's me. So that was the history of one of the 16-bit era's defining developers. Sensible Software helped define the Amiga, and its games are solidified in the hearts and minds of gamers to this day. Thanks to John and Stu for taking us through the history of Sensible Software, and keep an eye out for their full interviews which I'll upload in the coming weeks. And thank you very much for watching. Superstar here